So I guess I'm here to just share with you the latest things that excites me about um, AI. And, uh, and the title of my talk is From Seeing to Doing, Teaching Spatial Intelligence to Computers and Robots. And what really excites me is all of you are pixel people, and pixel really excites me. So let me begin by showing you something. Uh, well, other than the logo. In fact, I'm showing you nothing. This was the world 540 million years ago. Pure, endless darkness. It wasn't dark due to a lack of light. It was dark due to a lack of sight. Indeed, Sunlight filtered a thousand meters below the ocean surface, and light permeated from hydrothermal vents onto the ocean floor. Although brimming with life, there wasn't a single eye to be found anywhere in these ancient waters. No retinas, no corneas, no lenses. So all this light, all this life went unseen. There was a time when the very idea of seeing didn't exist yet, when it was something that had simply never been done before, until it was. For reasons we're only beginning to understand, trilobites, the first organisms that could sense light, emerged. They were the first inhabitants of the reality we all take for granted, the first to discover a world of many other selves. This ability to see is thought to have helped usher in a period called Cambrian Explosion, where a huge variety of animal species enter fossil records. What began as a passive experience, the simple act of letting light in soon became much richer and far more active. The nervous system began to evolve, sight turning to insight. Seeing became understanding. Understanding led to actions, and all of this gave rise to intelligence. So today, fast forward half a billion years later, we're no longer satisfied with just having nature's gift of visual intelligence. Our curiosity urges us to create machines that can see just as intelligently as we can do, if not better. So nine years ago, I was on TED stage and delivered what I called an early progress report on computer vision a subfield of artificial intelligence. At that time, three powerful forces had converged for the first time. A family of algorithms called neural network, fast, specialized hardware called graphic processing unit, or GPUs, and big data, like the collection of 50 million photos my lab spent years curating called ImageNet. When combined, these factors cause computers to not only see better than ever, but they also ushered in the modern age of AI. We've come a long way. Back then, just labeling objects was a breakthrough, like the first glimpse of light for those early trilobites. But the speed and accuracy of neural network algorithms rapidly improved. Year after year, the annual image that challenge led by my lab gauged the performance of these algorithms. And every year, the submissions broke records, as you can see from this plot showing the annual progress of some of the models, uh, milestone models. 
We have further developed models that can segment objects and recognize even dynamic relationships among them in videos, as shown here, beyond just labeling objects. But there is more to come. I remembered I, about 10 years ago, I showed the first computer vision algorithm that can describe images and photos in human natural language a way to do automatic caption writing. That was work done with my brilliant former student, Andre Kapathy. At that time, I pushed my luck and asked Andre to ask the computers to do the reverse, to create images based on verbal descriptions. And Andre said, haha, that's impossible. Well, as you can see from this tweet from him recently, in a few years, the impossible has become possible. That's, this is thanks to the development of, a recent, of the recent diffusion models used in generative AI. AI program can now take any human input sentence and create a photograph or a video of something that's entirely new. Many of you have seen the beautiful results of Sora by OpenAI. Even without an enormous number of GPUs, my students and our collaborators were able to create a generative model called Walt month before Sora. And there, here are just some of the results. Of course, we have room to grow, and we do make mistakes. I mean, look at that cat's eye and how it dips beneath the wave without getting wet. What a catastrophe. But if past this prologue, and we will learn from these mistakes and create a future we imagine. And in that future, we want to take full advantage of all that AI can do. For years, I have said that take a picture is not the same as to see and to understand it. Now, I'd like to add on to that. Simply seeing is not enough. Seeing is for doing and learning. When we act upon the world of 3D space-time, we learn, and we learn to see and do better. Nature has created this virtuous cycle of seeing and doing powered by spatial intelligence. To illustrate what your spatial intelligence does constantly, let's just look at this picture. Raise your hand if this photo makes you want to do something. Keep your hands up if it actually has happened in real life. In the split of a second, your brain look at the geometry of the glass, its place in 3D space, its relationship with the table, the cat, and everything around it, and you predict it what's going to happen next. And more than that, your brain has already computed something to make you dive towards that glass to save your carpet. Well, this urge to act is innate for beings with spatial intelligence, which links perception with action. So to advance AI beyond what its capabilities today, we need more than AI that can see or talk. We need AI that can do, just like what nature did to us. And indeed, we're making exciting progress here. Our recent milestone in spatial intelligence are catalyzing that virtuous cycle of teaching computers to see, do, learn, and then see and do better. And this is not easy. It took millions of years for animals to evolve spatial intelligence, which depends on the eye using light to project 2D images onto the retina and the brain translating these images into 3D. Only recently, a team of computer researchers, uh, computer vision researchers at Google just did that. They created an algorithm that can just take a set of photos and turn the data into 3D shape. And here are more of that uh, results of that work. 
But in the meantime, my student and colle uh, colleagues at Stanford went a step further and created an algorithm that only required one image to generate 3D shape. And here are some more of our results. And recall we previously used text input to create video. A group of researchers at University of Michigan figured out how to translate a line of text into 3D room layouts. Think about designing and, 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 and designing for uh, interior. Meanwhile, my colleagues and students at Stanford have developed an algorithm that, they, that can take an image and generate infinitely plausible spaces for viewers to explore, like getting into a different, entirely different world. These prototypes are the first budding sign of a future possibility, one where a human race captures our entire world in digital form and is able to model the richness and nuances of our world. What nature was able to do implicitly in our individual minds, spatial intelligence AI can now hope to do in our con collective conscious. As the progress of spatial intelligence accelerates, a new era in this virtuous cycle is playing out before our eyes. This back and forth is catalyzing robotic learning, a critical component to any embodied intelligence system that needs to directly understand and interact with the 3D world. A decade ago, ImageNet from my lab enabled a database with millions of high-quality images to help computers to learn to see. Now we're doing that with behaviors and actions that teach computers how to act in 3D world. Instead of manually creating training examples, we now use simulation environments powered by 3D spatial models that offer endless variety and interactions. You're now seeing just a small set of examples of the infinite possibilities for training our robots in simulation environment. And this is a project my lab has developed called Behavior. There's also exciting progress in robotic language intelligence. Using large language model-based input, my students and collaborators are among the first teams to show robotic arm performing a wide range of tasks based on verbal instructions, like something like, can you open the top drawer and watch out for the vase? Or unplug the a fully charged cell phone? Or uh, can you make, ask the robot to make a sandwich and put a napkin for the, for the person. Well, typically, I'd like a little more on my sandwich, but this is not a bad start. In that primordial ocean 540 million years ago, the ability to see and perceive one's environment set off a Cambrian explosion of interactions with other life forms. Today, that light is starting to reach digital minds, just as it once did to our ancestors. Spatial intelligence technologies are allowing machines to interact with one another, with humans, and with the 3D world, real or imagined. With this future taking shape, we can imagine how it will have a profound impact on so many lives. Let's take a healthcare as an example. In the past decade, my lab took some of the first steps towards applying AI technology to challenges impacting patient outcomes and medical staff burnout rates. Together with my students and colleagues at Stanford School of Medicine and partnering hospitals, we're piloting smart sensors that can detect when a clinician enters a patient room without properly washing their hands keep track of instruments during surgery, and alert care team when a patient is at physical risk of falling. We consider these technology to be a form of ambient intelligence, and these extra pairs of eyes make a difference. 
But I would like to, I would love to see more interactive help for patients, clinicians, and care, caregivers who also desperately need an extra pair of hands. Imagine autonomous robots transporting medical supplies so caregivers can get more quality time uh, with patients, or augmented reality guiding surgeons towards safer, more efficient, and less invasive operations. Or imagine patients with severe paralysis controlling robots with their thoughts. That's right, with brain waves, so they can do everyday tasks that you and I take for granted. We actually, we're actually seeing a glimpse of this future in a pilot study from my lab. As you can see in this video, here, a robotic arm is cooking a Japanese sukiyaki meal controlled only by brain electrical signals non-invasively collected through EEG caps. So half a billion years ago, the emergence of vision not only turned a world of darkness upside down, it also kicked off the most profound evolutionary process, the development of intelligence in the animal world. AI's breathtaking progress in the past decade is just as astounding. But the true digital Cambrian explosion won't realize its fullest potential until computers and robots have developed the kind of spatial intelligence that nature has endowed to all of us. It's now time to train our digital companions to learn how to reason and interact with this incredible 3D space we call home and to create many new worlds for all of us to explore. Realizing this future won't be easy. It will require us taking thoughtful steps to develop technology that, not, that always keep humans at the center. If done right, computers and robots powered by spatial intelligence will not only be useful tools, but also be trusted partners that can augment and enhance our productivity and humanity while respecting our individual dignity and lifting our collective prosperity. So what excites me the most is the future in which, as AI grows ever more perceptive, insightful, and spatially aware, it joins us in our quest to satisfy our curiosity, to always pursue a better way so we can make a better world. Thank you.